in school. If you're a student here, good to see you all this morning out and about. A little diversion from your typical uh, coursework, and we're excited to have you here. And of course, all of our community members and uh, faculty and staff that have showed up today as well. We appreciate your attendance. Um, not exactly Chamber of Commerce weather out there this morning, uh, Mr. Governor, but uh, you know we didn't get the nickname Green Country for uh, just any reason, and certainly a big distinction between the Altus Oklahomans of the world and the uh, Miami Oklahomans of the world. So uh, we appreciate uh, you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. And speaking of uh, Chamber of Commerce weather, we have our executive director with us today is uh, Miss Cindy Morris. There you go. Stand up, Cindy, so we can say thank you for helping us get this organized here today. And Governor, some good things going on in our Chamber of Commerce. We have uh, over 400 members here that serve the greater Ottawa County area, so great business interest and support for the local chamber here, a very active chamber. Uh, last year in the state of Oklahoma, we had the um, outstanding new event. Uh, Miami Now, which is a, an event that's coming up in a couple of weeks that really celebrates our Native American heritage uh, on this uh, campus and in this community and region. So very proud of the efforts of uh, Cindy and many others to make that happen. Uh, speaking of our Native American um, heritage here, we have the chairman of the Intertribal Council back in the very back, uh, Ron Sparkman. Would you wave, Ron? Thank you for being here this morning. And Ottawa County in this region is uh, very unique. Uh, we're uh, the only county in the state of Oklahoma, the only county in the United States to have nine federally recognized tribes in one very condensed area and very impressed with the quality of the output and the work that gets uh, accomplished through the Tribal Council and just wanted to recognize Ron for the great work there. We have our uh, state representative that's here with us this morning. Let's see, I saw Larry Glenn sleep, slip in. Right there, Larry, good to have you with us. I know he would want me to say this, you know, he was inducted into the NEO Alumni Hall of Fame last Saturday, so we're very proud of the contributions. I'm just kidding about him wanting me to say that, but uh, we are proud of Larry and uh, all the good things that he helps uh, the college and the community with here on campus. And so, um, and we have our city manager here, Tim Wilson. Tim, thank you for all the staff that uh, you brought with you this morning. Help me welcome Tim Wilson. And if I hadn't introduced you, then, uh, and you'd like to be introduced, then raise your hand and I'll see if I can pick you out there and uh, say a little bit about you. But uh, actually, uh, very, again, very honored to have each of you here with us today to be able to welcome the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Oklahoma. He's a native Oklahoman, very proud of his Oklahoma roots, I know. In fact, he's an Enid Plainsman out of Enid High School and uh, played a little athletics there and uh, you know, I, I think anybody that's been in that part of the state knows how proud that north central part of the state of Oklahoma is and how integral it is to uh, the great state of Oklahoma. He comes from uh, a long line of family members that have been uh, great public servants. His dad was a longtime state senator, continues to wreak havoc all throughout the state of Oklahoma when he shows up for uh, public appearances. But um, really good to have uh, Todd uh, on our campus here today. Just a little bit about him. Um, like I mentioned, a native Oklahoman uh, is a, uh, was in the Secret Service. Many people probably don't realize that about Tom, but he was uh, serving in the United States Secret Service. Also worked in the Keating administration and served on the staff for uh, United States Senator um, Don Nichols. In 2009, uh, Todd became the first Republican majority floor leader in the state history. I know that was not only a tough job, but a very exciting time uh, in his life. Um, maybe the most important thing about uh, Todd that I could share with you here today is that uh, he's been married to 16 years, and I know he's uh, very devoted to his wife, Monica, and their two children, uh, Griffin, who is age 11, and Lauren, who's age 8. So help me welcome to the podium our Lieutenant Governor from the great state, Todd Lamb. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm going to walk down here. Is that okay with everybody? If I come down here, kind of Phil Donahue, hot, Donahue style. I've just dated myself. Everybody Google Phil Donahue. Uh, before, before I get started, I'm gonna, my, my goal is this. I want to make some, some brief comments. My goal is brief comments. And then kind of turn it up. up to you, turn it over to you, and get your thoughts, suggestions, advice for me to serve you better as Lieutenant Governor or to carry any water back to the state capitol 
for the governor, uh, the governor's cabinet, and any uh, state, uh, state officials there at the Capitol that I can relay messages to so we can serve you better. Before I get started, I want to pass this around. Th this is a sign-in sheet. And if you do me a favor, uh, sign in. And it's not to put you on a distribution list to hassle you. This is for the sole purpose of me sending you a thank you note for coming this morning. So the better you print, the more accurate I will get your name. Uh, I would hate to uh, say, Tom, thanks for coming. Your name's Todd. You think, well, he's a jerk. I'll never vote for him again. And what a louse. Uh, so if you would, and, and all the pressure's on the president. He's going to start us off and show you how, how nice he can print. Uh, but please sign in so we can send you that follow-up thank you note. And you could be anywhere today in Miami or, or Ottawa County and, and going about your lives, your business, class activity. I'm sure no students are here because their professor said you get class credit uh, or time, time well served or anything like that. But thanks for coming anyway. Uh, I, I appreciate it. But the fact that you took time to come out today and to listen and, and to give some feedback, I sincerely appreciate that. President Hale, it's great to be on your campus. And I'm, I, I'm a little hesitant to say this, and since I just said that, my chief of staff in the back of the room, Keith Beal, uh, right there, he's a, yeah, there you go. Now he's real nervous because I just made that comment. But I, I want to say, Mr. President, uh, this is, this is, we've been treated well by a lot of higher ed institutions around the state for town hall meetings and being welcomed into communities, uh, but nobody's treated us better than the Norsemen. And opening up your campus, uh, inviting all the community to come, inviting, encouraging the students to come. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for opening up your, your home today. I, I appreciate that. Uh, the role of Lieutenant Governor, I want to cover that real quick because as I've traveled around the state, I see pens writing. That must have been question number one. <laughs> On the campaign trail, I hit every one of Oklahoma's 77 counties because I didn't want to be a lieutenant governor that represented part of Oklahoma or just visited part of our state. I visited every county in Oklahoma on the campaign trail. It's my second time to do that in my career. This first year in office, my goal is again to hit all of Oklahoma's 77 counties because I want feedback and I'm, I'm compiling th this report that today we'll go into. It's called the Lieutenant Governor's Policy Report or Lieutenant Governor's Issue Report, Policy or Issue Report. First time it's ever been done in state history. I'm gonna take this report uh, from what I've heard all around the state my first year in office and give it to the governor and the legislative leaders on suggestions and advice on what our citizens believe we need to do to move Oklahoma, uh, move Oklahoma forward and be competitive particularly in the area of economic development. I'll take any suggestions or advice, but particularly in the, in the environment or the arena of economic development. So I'll, as of this week, at the end of this week, from January 10th to the end of this week, I've been to 59 of our counties. Uh, if you do the mental math real quick, that's a whole lot of travel, but it's very enjoyable. Just last Monday, uh, two Mondays ago, I was in Hollis, Oklahoma, the county seat of Harmon County, extreme southwest Oklahoma. So from Hollis to Miami, we've already been to Kenton, we've already been to Idabel, we now have the four corners covered. So we're glad to, glad to be in Miami today. And that travel, that my, back to my office and Lieutenant Governor, what the role is. The, my portfolio, if we can call it that, the first third of my portfolio are my constitutional and legal responsibilities I get via statute or the constitu state constitution, which means I chair the Tourism and Recreation Commission. Write that down. Um, I also serve on the comp source board. I serve on the board of equalization, which certifies the money appropriate that the legislature can appropriate for the next fiscal uh, year and other agency boards and commissions. The second third of my portfolio as lieutenant governor are the assignments and duties I receive from the governor. And the governor and lieutenant governor, for those of you that are students that may not be from Oklahoma and didn't have ninth grade history, part of our curriculum, the Oklahoma uh, governor and lieutenant governor are elected independent of one another, which means as our citizens know, they've not always gotten along. But Governor Fallon and I do, so therefore I received some assignments and responsibilities from Governor Fallon. I was her first appointment during the transition to her cabinet. I also serve as the cabinet secretary for the advocate of small business. Over 95% of all local homans are either employed in small business or own a small business. That's the second third of my portfolio. The last third of my portfolio dovetails nicely from that second in that it, that is my agenda, that is my platform for Oklahoma, it's my third part of my portfolio, economic development. Now I know we're pretty close to Missouri. We're real close to Missouri. 
So therefore, we're close to Arkansas, we're close to Kansas, where we are today. But I've got this, with all due respect from everybody from, is that way south, Mr. President? Is that south? Okay, you like to be Lieutenant Governor, not Navigator. Uh, this, this state really south of us, the state of Texas. Now, the Norsemen are known for their success on the athletic court, arena, field, what have you. The Norsemen are known for that, as is, as are the Sooners, the Cowboys, the Golden Hurricane, and those other schools. You know, we expect whoever we're playing in Texas, we don't expect to, to compete, we expect to beat whoever NEO plays in Texas, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, Houston, Rice, Baylor, SMU, TCU, UTEP, and North Texas State. Because we're Oklahoma, we're darn good at athletics. Right, NEO? I mean, you could write a book on that. Well, as Lieutenant Governor, I want to compete not with the region up, not just with the region up here in Missouri, Kansas, and Arkansas, but I want to compete with the state of Texas. And here's why. Last year, more people moved to Texas than any state in the nation. Last year, more private sector jobs were created in Texas than any other state in the nation. Last, or as of April of this year, as of April, Texas was number one in the nation of Fortune 500 companies location. They dropped down to number three, bless their heart. Texas created this environment that allows entrepreneurs to thrive and prosper and flourish in the state of Texas. And here's what's frustrating. On each side of the Red River that you could walk across on most days without getting your feet muddy, on each side of the Red River, the air's the same, the water's the same, the accent's the same. Here are some differences. Our wives are prettier and our kids are smarter. And the other difference, which is alarming and challenging to us as Oklahomans, Texas created a public policy and policies to allow businesses to thrive and prosper. So let's go beat them at something besides football, meaning economic development. How do you do that? Not just rhetoric. It's easy for the coach to go in pregame or halftime and say, block better, run faster, tackle better, and, and run harder. That's easy stuff. What matters is the play you call and how you execute it. In public policy, that means laws you make to allow businesses to retain, to stay and keep in Ottawa County and in Miami, or for businesses to be attracted to Oklahoma. A little recap on this past legislative session on some policy issues. First of which, we passed what's called One Stop Shop in Oklahoma. One Stop Shop. It's in the very first stages, elementary stages, of allowing entrepreneurs to go into business quicker, easier, so we can employ more people all around the state. Right now, if you're an entrepreneur, when your family went into business or you went into business, you had to go to this state agency, this state department, this state official, uh, all different, okay, to get a form, to get a signature, to get a stamp, to get a seal of approval, just to go into business. That's government at its worst. Preventing people and putting regulation between jobs and people. We are trying to eliminate that at state capital with one stop shop. And we're just in the first stages of doing that. Second issue of public policy that I would argue has been very good for our state and will be good in, in the years to come. We enacted this past year, I mentioned as Lieutenant Governor, my first role are agency boards and commissions I serve on. I serve on the Board of Equalization. I mentioned that appropriates, certifies the appropriated dollars the legislature can dole out to our state agencies. Well, on the Board of Equalization, we voted to implement a tax cut from five and a half to five and a quarter. Now, that's incremental. Those of you that are really good at math and appreciate math, that's incremental lowerization, five and a half to five and a quarter. But here's why I would argue for you and make the point that it's very, very good for Oklahoma. When states like California and Illinois are increasing their taxes in the billions, and that's with a capital B, in billions of dollars. So much so, Caterpillar Incorporated, you know, the big heavy equipment, the yellow machines that move, move dirt around and build stuff, they're headquartered in Illinois. They are publicly frustrated with Governor Quinn in Illinois because of the tax increases in Illinois. Sears and Roebuck, who Miami, my hometown of Enid, Hollis, Tulsa for that matter, would love to have Sears and Roebuck headquartered in their communities. Sears and Roebuck, front page of the Wall Street Journal this past May, said, Governor Quinn, we are considering leaving Illinois because of your tax increases. 
So when Oklahoma implements that tax cut to allow people to keep more of the money they earn, that's an important public policy statement for a state to move forward. The last area that's public policy related to economic development, job retention and job creation, that's workers' comp reform. And as I traveled around the state, whether it was on the campaign for 77 counties or 59 now, I've yet to be in a county, Mr. President, where workers' compensation reform has not come up. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, workers' comp, workers' comp, workers' comp. When I ask the question, what's your greatest impediment to growth? If it's a, smed a, a small, medium, or large-sized business, the response I receive is, Todd, we need meaningful, comprehensive workers' comp reform. This past session, we passed roughly a $30 million. Y'all are taking really good notes. That's a full page already. <laughs> That's better than people I sit with at church. That's good. <laughs> this past session, we passed roughly a $30 million cost savings to business. $30 million, that, that's pretty significant. But we can always do better. Businesses are still hoping for more and asking for more. Here are three areas of reform that I would offer to you that we need to, that's kind of my forecast, and, and you've got a great representative here. Let me just comment on, on Larry. I, I've known Representative Glenn uh, for a while, and, and he and my dad have known each other for a number of years. Uh, you've got a man of integrity and a commitment and a passion for this community, this university, of course. He's in the Hall of Fame, after all, but also for this community and the district he represents. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to, to serve with him. As I've talked to these lawmakers going forward this next legislative session, three areas of reform in workers' comp. First of which, Governor Fallon will address single-handedly, and that's the appointment of conservative judges to the workers' compensation bench. Now, stop. I did not say Republican judges. I said conservative judges to the workers' comp bench. Here's why. In the last 14 years, every year except one, rate of claims have gone down before the workers' comp court. Claims have gone down. So logically, Oklahoma's not a very dangerous place to work. We're getting less dangerous. Rate of claims going down, dipping. At the same time, rate of awards are skyrocketing. On the graph, it's a sideways V. Those numbers in Oklahoma can't be reconciled, but they should be very reconcilable in any state, particularly in Oklahoma. So that says judges are out of control. In special session of 2005, the legislature, when I was in the Senate, in the Senate we passed Senate Bill 1X. It was ignored by the workers' compensation judges. Not kind of ignored, it was ignored. Judges are doing what they want unilaterally, and they're out of control in some, some of the awards they're given conservative judges, I said, not just Republican judges. That's not what I said. Second area of reform. We need to add fraud investigators to the workers' compensation attorney general's fraud unit. Right now we have some, some fraud investigators, but it's not enough. There'll always be fraud on workers' comp because a human element will always be involved in workers' comp. Here's how we can do it without it being cost prohibitive. There are many people like me in Oklahoma that have a law enforcement background. Retired troopers, retired sheriffs, retired deputies, retired police officers, retired tribal police, retired military police, retired federal agents that live in Oklahoma, all retired and they would love to supplement their retirement income. We should bring them into the Attorney General's fraud unit on a contract basis. No pension required, no retirement required, no benefits required, a contract by contract basis with these fraud investigators, hand them a case file and say, determine if there's fraud. There may not be, but there might be. And fraud is one of the, the cost risers in business when there's fraud in the system. And fraud also hurts the employee that's legitimately injured. It hurts that employee. The last area of workers' comp reform that we need to look at, <clears throat> we need to look at as a state is allowing businesses some options. Some people call it opt-out, I call it options. Providing businesses latitude. Workers' comp, for those of you that are just kind of entering your freshman year, you're not really uh, sure what workers' comp is, th that is the, the court of exclusive remedy for businesses. To remove themselves from district court and the tort system in Oklahoma and say, we'll sign up for workers' comp, it's a mandate, we'll, we're in workers' comp, and that way our, we'll, we'll serve benefits to our employee and we won't be sued in the tort system. So we kind of have a matrix of where we are with possible liability with an, with an injured employee. Well, it was set up, and we understand why it was set up, with good intentions. But over years, it's become mandate after mandate after mandate after mandate after mandate. And these small businesses that are employing Oklahomans are having their rates go up for absolutely no reason. No claims being made and rates are going up. Well, let's provide these businesses some, some latitude in how they pay for workers' comp 
And if you're a paper company that's pushed paper for 25 years and the worst claim you've had is a really, really bad paper cut that required two Band-Aids, you might want to opt out of workers' comp. You don't have the option right now. We should provide that option if no claims have been made and you can still provide coverage to your employee through an additional ERISA benefit or some other creative method paying your workers' comp costs with your health care premiums, latitude and options to the businesses that are employing Oklahomans in every county in this great state. I went on a little longer than I needed to, and I'm winding down now. If you have any questions or suggestions or advice, get ready for that. Is the list just right there? That's one slow-moving list. Um, I didn't mean write that neat. <laughs> Oklahoma is on the cusp of a renaissance. And I want to say that particularly to the students in the room today. I gave five college commencements this past May. And I gave one high school commencement of a graduating class of one. You know you're in demand as a speaker when you've got a high school graduating class of one. Um, but five, five, that'll sink in later. Five, Five, five college commencements, and my theme was the same, and I want to share that theme quickly with you today. Oklahoma's on the cusp of a renaissance, and renaissance, renaissance means rebirth. Hence, we've been there before. We're going back to the summit where we once were as a state. We're headed back right now. So I was giving this address, and, and one of the addresses I gave was at OSU, gallagher Ibarina, Arena, you know, 850 graduates on the court, about 12,000 in the arena, and I, I've said those words, Oklahoma's on the cusp of a renaissance. I leaned forward on the podium, I said, looking after the graduates, I said, I said, do not leave. I gave him a pass, I said, okay, if you leave, hurry back, because now is the time to be engaged in Oklahoma's economy. It's like buying the first house in a brand new neighborhood. Your value is going nowhere but up from here, but now's the time to be engaged. You know, Twitter is a wonderful thing because it's a stream of consciousness. And rarely, you can back me up on this, I think, rarely do you read a tweet and you think they really thought before they hit send on that tweet. Now, it's a stream of consciousness. I mean, people just like, I'm eating a burrito, send. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the update. Three days after I gave the OSU commencement, my press secretary walked in the office and she was holding a piece of paper, and she said, while you were giving the OSU commencement, there was a young lady, a graduate, tweeting during your address. Buckle up, gulp. I thought, well, I can't wait to hear what this colorful tweet has to say. And th this is what it read. At OSU commencement, about to graduate, dot, dot, dot. Lieutenant Governor Lamb, keynote speaker, dot, dot, dot. I'm afraid if I leave this state, Todd Lamb will come and hunt me down. <laughs> she got the message. Don't leave, because now is the time for opportunity. And I, I, I'm supposed to say that as lieutenant governor. I mean, that's, I'm supposed to. But let me tell you, particularly those that are Norsemen, I believe it. I absolutely believe it. With the policy we're enacting at the state capitol, and not just because of the state capitol, but policy that the regulation that's being removed or policy that's being enacted, and what the private sector is doing with partnership and education, preparing a workforce for tomorrow, Oklahoma is on that cusp. And now is the best time to prove John Steinbeck wrong once and for all, that we don't move west. West moves here to relocate. Our jobs can stay here. Our companies can stay here. Our businesses can thrive here and we'll get a perception where businesses in Joplin, in Wichita, in Little Rock, and in Dallas, they want to relocate here. That's the ultimate goal, and that doesn't happen overnight. I mean, we had a meeting, uh, Keith and I, my chief said, we had a meeting earlier this week for an event for 2021. We're working on it now. Now, you know, I. My wife says, you can't run for re-election. I'll be long gone maybe by then. Who knows if, I, if I'll still be in public life or not. But that's how long some of this stuff takes, particularly public policy, to make Oklahoma a thriving, thriving, pr prosperous state. And I'd comment about Texas, and here's why. Depending on which economic indicator you looked at at Texas, they'd be the 15th richest economy in the world 
15th in the world, not the nation, in the world. So once you compete with Texas, you compete internationally automatically. And I want to please write this down if you're, if you're taking notes for your class. I don't want Oklahoma to be like Texas. I just want us to be a little bit better. That's all I want as lieutenant governor. My, my son's in fifth grade. My daughter's in second grade. <laughs> I want them to live and work here because they want to. And I don't want to be forced out of state after they get their degree to go find a job somewhere else. Thank you all for coming out. I went on longer than I anticipated. Uh, I'm going to read one letter to you, and then I, I want to ask you for your advice and suggestions. I've been working with these communities, our, our local chambers and our, our higher ed officials, like President Hale and, and our chamber executives, all throughout the state in a partnership. Governor Fallon's the head coach, and she, she makes those blue chip recruiting phone calls. But when communities where the governor can't because of a conflict in schedule, when she can't participate in economic development, uh, I go out and I partnership with these different communities. And I met with a community um, earlier this year, and this, this gentleman, they have no presence in Oklahoma, no, no business presence whatsoever. Uh, this gentleman's from Europe. He is president of the North American division of their international company located on the East Coast. And he wrote me this follow-up letter. Dear Governor Lamb, that's not what I'm saying. That's what he wrote, so nobody texts Governor Fallon. That's what he wrote. Dear Governor Lamb, thank you for inviting me to your great state and for taking the time to meet with me in blank community. I value the time that you and the Commerce Secretary spent presenting me with business opportunities in Oklahoma. I'm very impressed with the business climate and am confident that Oklahoma offers a more promising prospect for our business expansion than does the state of Texas. Policy matters, tenacity matters, education matters to move Oklahoma forward. And that letter is just a prime example of what we can do if we, if we work really, really hard. Thank you for coming out. That's my final close. And I'll be happy to open up and take any suggestions or questions or advice that you may have. Yes, Representative. <laughs> In the back here is re former State Representative Wayne Pettigrew, businessman, and you'll see Wayne again. He's running for Congress, and he came out today. <laughs> Representative, thank you. I forget stuff every once in a while. Would you travel the rest of the day with us? <laughs> Pressure's on now, Larry. Representative Pettigrew, th thanks for coming out. Thank you. If there are no questions, was it? Now, see, today's what? Wednesday, Thursday, Thursday. So it's, so it's two hour credit day, right? So I got a lot more time. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, the, my proposal, no, it would not. It would not uh, address the sooner care, any sooner care issues or anything like that. It would be primarily for, solely for the workers' comp and the attorney general fraud investigative unit. But if there's something in sooner care, you know, I'll be happy to talk with you one-on-one -on -one about that. And that's one more thing. When we finish with the formal discussion here, I'm not darting out. Um, I've got to leave by noon, so I've, I've got time before I need to dart out. But I, I, um, I'll visit with you one-on-one -on -one if you have any questions or advice one-on-one. -on -one and that's why Keith's here with me also. Yes, sir, Mr. President. Great question, President. Th thank you for asking that. Could everybody hear him in the back? He was talking about the divide in urban and rural Oklahoma and economic development and everywhere he's traveled. How do we make sure to prevent that divide from being problematic? Well, first of all, let me show you my conviction. Uh, being an Enid boy, okay, being born and raised in Enid, Oklahoma, my family still lives there. Now my immediate family, my wife and kids, we live in the metro area. But being born and raised in Enid, my conviction is 
the sun does not rise, nor does it set in Tulsa. The sun does not rise, nor does it set in Oklahoma City. We have 77 counties in Oklahoma. And I mentioned that in my opening comments. That's why I'm going to everyone again for the third time in my career, going, with these different, going to these different communities. We have to have a focus that's not an urban or an urbane focus in economic development. It is also must be a rural economic development focus. I was in Enid earlier this week, not just because it was my hometown, but we had a job announcement in Enid, $400 million wind farm investment in Enid. Construction jobs of 150 people when it's being built out. After it's up and running, only about 20, 20 jobs, a $5 million revenue stream to the city of Enid or Garfield County and Grant County. After it's completed, it's going to be a transmission line from Enid all the way to Alabama, providing wind energy to the state of Alabama. Point being, that's what I've done as lieutenant governor. The letter I read to you from that gentleman from Europe that said Oklahoma looks better than Texas right now, that was a rural community. That was not Tulsa. That was not Oklahoma City. That was a local chamber I worked with and a local mayor I worked with in rural Oklahoma to try to land some jobs there. That's what I'm doing as lieutenant governor, and that's what our state should focus on in the legislature. That's what the governor's focused on. I come in to speak for her, of course. She can, for, she can speak for herself, but that's what she's focused on, and that's what I'm committed to as lieutenant governor. Yes, sir. Yes, we should try to raise that. We should always try to raise the bar. Whatever education level we have, we should always try to continue to, to learn and improve on that, deferring to the governor just for a moment. Uh, she is releasing today her higher ed initiative for this upcoming legislative session, which begins in February of, of 2012. She's releasing that today. We had a cabinet meeting yesterday, and she said she'd be releasing some of those figures. One of the challenges we have as a state, and I can't give you the, the raw number, we have a high percentage of individuals that have started their associate's degree and never finished, started their bachelor's degree and never finished. I get it. I mean, I went, I went to law school later in life after having a family, being married, one child, second child born in law school. You know, life sometimes interrupts our educational pursuits. I've been there, done that. As a state, and I don't have the answer for you, but that parallels your question We've got to get our Oklahomans to finish what you started and, and encourage them to do that so we can have a very high-quality educator workforce so they can pursue the jobs that they want and not land where they have to, but pursue the jobs that they want to. That's why we're on the campus at NEO and not out in the rain. We know we have 75,000 in Oklahoma that have 90 uh, hours of college credit. There's a figure right there. That's it. 75,000 with 90 yeah, 75,000 Oklahomans with 90 hours. I mean, you're close. I mean, you, just, how, you are close. I mean, you can fall off the cliff and fall into that deal. I mean, you are so close. We've got to get them back to finish, right, President? Anything else? And I don't want to make this go longer than it needs to. Yes, yes sir. Did you ever hear the question? Uh, last night in Congress, a bill was passed regarding right to work states and Boeing and the challenge we've had in South Carolina and Ohio and, and some other states, Wisconsin. I, I don't, I'm happy to say I don't know what Congress did last night. Um, what was that? Okay. I don't know what Congress, what Congress did last night. Oklahoma's a right to work state. Uh, we're not on the brink of going back to where we were before. Uh, that is good public policy for Oklahoma. It's an additional arrow in our quiver. The Boeing jobs that have come to Oklahoma, the 550 Boeing jobs announced last year, they're coming to Oklahoma because we're a right-to-work state. They're not coming to Oklahoma for any other reason. Uh, that's something the governor will continue to protect, I will continue to advocate for, and I don't think Oklahoma, you know, Wisconsin, they have different laws in Wisconsin, different laws in South Carolina. That's a, that's a state issue, right-to-work. We passed that, and what year was it, Keith, Representative? 2002, 2003, by the, and the people voted for it. The legislature didn't do it. People voted for right to work, and we're not in danger of losing that. Uh, yes, sir.
If you have any suggestions or advice, I'll be happy to put that in the report that I'm submitting to the governor and the, and the legislative leaders. Uh, we do have career tech, of course, and that's one thing Oklahoma does better than anybody is our career tech system. We've got a career tech system that, that, that everybody tries to emulate as opposed to us trying to copy somebody else that partners well with higher education and, and our industry. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and that's why I talked about the cusp of a renaissance and the job announcement in Enid, uh, the Boeing announcement, uh, you know, months ago, uh, prior landed uh, uh, Google, and there are a lot of things right now that are in the works. This letter I have in my pocket, that deal's not sealed. There are a lot of things in the work right now, but no, companies, no company wants to relocate if the public policy doesn't welcome them. And the companies that are here already, I mean, that's number one, is organic growth, business retention of the companies we have in Oklahoma already. These companies, it's not ball and chain. They can pick up and leave. If the taxes get too high, regulation gets too messy, or any other public issue gets too encumbersome, they can just boogie. So we've got to make sure to work on the public policy first for long, sustaining growth for those high-paying jobs in, in Oklahoma. No, and, and Oklahoma's, Oklahoma's ticking up. When I was in Grant County this week, that's Medford, Oklahoma, not far from my hometown of Enid. I've been there countless times throughout my career. There's a pulse in Medford right now because of high-paying jobs that have relocated to Medford. It's a lot related to the oil and gas industry. Thank God that we have hydrocarbons under our soil. A lot of that's oil and gas in, uh, related. But as we continue to diversify, we'll never divorce ourselves from oil and gas, never divorce ourselves from agriculture because those are our backbone. That's our economical, economic backbone in Oklahoma. We have, must continue to focus and thrive for diversification for those aerospace jobs. In addition to serving as lieutenant governor, I, I vice, I'm vice chair of the Aerospace States Association. That's got nothing to do with my lieutenant governor gig, but the Aerospace States Association is a national association focused on aerospace research, engineering, development, job creation, job retention uh, that I'm engaged with on a, on a monthly basis for those high paying jobs and public policy like the aerospace tax credit to, to, to recruit those jobs and bring those jobs to Oklahoma or keep them here. Sure. One last question. Yes, ma'am. Right. It's the last three miles. Well, I will tell you face to face, eyeball to eyeball, in all my travels, that's the first time I've heard of that. <laughs> I, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. But you know what? But that, that's I'm, that's the a great question to end on because that illustrates the point of this town hall meeting. You know, in the past, I think a, a lot of LGs have gone out and then a lot of Kiwanis, Lions, Ambucks, chain, and I'm I'm doing all those. They're great to do, but that's why this is so healthy because it's a discussion. As much as I've traveled, and I've been I've been to Ottawa County before, I've been to Miami before. I've yet to hear that issue. So that, one, I'm glad I came. So I don't have an answer for you on what's being done with tourism, but let's make a comment as the, as the chair of the Tourism Commission. Now, keep this in mind, students. When you're elected lieutenant governor in Oklahoma, you're immediately, 
by law, the chairman of the Tourism and Recreation Commission, by law. At the same time, you do not run the tourism department and you serve with commissioners appointed solely by the governor. <laughs> Only in government will we figure that deal out. Uh, so I don't have an answer for you on that, but I'm so glad you told me because that's going to go in the report and I'm going to visit. I was with Secretary Ridley yesterday. Is that, do you know if that's even in the eight-year plan? No, it's not in the eight-year plan? Who said no? It's, it's not on the plan? Okay. I'll ask why, and I'll find out some answers for you. Route 66 is a great draw to Oklahoma. I know, I know about the European travelers already. Tourism uh, students, and I'm winding down with this, that's, that's the third largest industry revenue source for the state of Oklahoma, third. I mean, tourism is a great draw for the coffers in, in the state of Oklahoma. We have a, it, and those of you out of state, you're learning more about Oklahoma, but Oklahoma's extremely unique in tourism. Our unique culture and how we were settled, either by forced relocation and the entrepreneurship of the Native Americans uh, w once they arrived here, the land run settlers and their entrepreneurship drive. So we got a rich culture, but more man-made lakes in any state in the nation, more shoreline than the Atlantic Coast and Gulf Coast combined, over one million uh, surface acres of water. We have four mountain ranges in Oklahoma and 24% of our state's covered by forest. When you want to do something in tourism, you come to Oklahoma. You know, you can do everything here but snow ski, and that's dangerous, so you don't want to do that. <laughs> Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for coming out today, and I appreciated your advice, suggestions, and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, President. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Join me on the stage here just okay. a second. Okay. Yep. Want to, uh, yeah. Let, the, uh, let the uh, governor know that we like to grow our north early, so I'd ask you to kind of pull that out there for, uh, Griffin and Lauren, we got some, uh, yeah, we got two of those here That's for you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you very much, too. Yeah. Biff love that. Mm -hmm. And it's a hoodie. Yep, thank, thank you, you Press. Yeah, thank you, thank very, you very much. much. All right. Those don't fit you, let us know. All right. All right. Yep, drop that in there. We stand adjourned. Uh, your wife saved us on the side. Did you?